everyone for joining us today for data everyone for joining us today for data theorems webinar series today our topic will be how to leverage ios 13 for app security now before we get started i just want to provide a little bit of background on who data theorem is the company was founded in 2013 in the heart of Silicon Valley and were headquartered in Palo Alto, California with offices in Paris and in New York. Our executive team has over 15 years in the cybersecurity industry, which has led, to us, led us to have a great deal of success and given us the chance and privilege to work with many great customers as you can see here today. Now, before I hand over to our speaker today, just want to mention that we will reserve time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. So if you have questions during the presentation, please put those in the Q&A panel. With that, I will turn it over to Philip Tenen, our iOS security engineer at Data Theorem. Thanks, Felicia. So as we mentioned, today I'm going to be talking about um, some of what's new and what's changing uh, in iOS 13 as far as app security goes. Um, so in particular, we're going to be discussing some new cryptography APIs that Apple has introduced, uh, which make it more straightforward to securely encrypt and decrypt data. Um, additionally, some hashing algorithms, which are also related to cryptography, were officially discouraged this year by Apple as they are known to be vulnerable to multiple attacks. Um, Apple is now enforcing stricter requirements for TLS connections, which ensures that data is transmitted securely over the network. Additionally, there are some new user visible changes coming with iOS 13 as well. In particular, Apple is now offering their own secure, secure sign-on service with privacy at the forefront. iOS 13 is providing more visibility into um, app tracking and the data that apps are collecting on users. And lastly, Apple is adding new restrictions um, on what sorts of data apps can collect where those apps are targeted towards children. So let's dive in. Firstly, I'd like to cover these new cryptography APIs, but before I do so, I would like to show the old APIs and where they fall flat. So here on this slide, you can see here's a lot of these old cryptography APIs. They're called the Common Crypto Framework. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can configure these um, and different options for different encryption modes, different um, flights you can set and modes you can pass and passwords you can use. Um, and the issue with these APIs is that they're very complex and they're very easy to misuse. And if you do misuse them, you end up sort of uh, shooting yourself in the foot as it renders the data you were trying to encrypt totally insecure. So the real problem with these APIs is that you have all these options and everything that's in red uh, is a place that these APIs can be misused to effectively shoot yourself in the foot and, and break your cryptographic operation. So to look at one of these more in depth, if we just pick a random one of these common crypto functions, um, every argument that I've circled here uh, is a place that a developer can make a mistake um, and you know encrypt something insecurely. And there are so many different ways that you can make these sorts of mistakes. So it requires a lot of upfront knowledge on the part of the developer to use these APIs in a secure way. As you can see, um, there's the potential to accidentally use an insecure cryptography algorithm, use an insecure mode. Um, there's the ability to, for the developer to try to encrypt data with um, no password or with a statically embedded password, which both provide little to no security. There are mistakes the developer can make in regards to what's called an initialization vector, which if done improperly on the part of the developer can leak information about the data that's being encrypted. The developer could um, incorrectly use a low number of encryption rounds, which can also leak data and lead to a brute force attack. Um, so there's lots of places to go wrong with these algorithms. So the problems with the old cryptography APIs is that there are lots of different ways to get it wrong and to make your crypto code insecure. Additionally, these, these APIs require a deep understanding of cryptography to use correctly. Um, developers need to understand uh, the characteristics of initialization vectors. They need to know which cryptography algorithms are secure versus insecure. Um, they need to manage their own keys and embed keys in a way that's secure. Um, there's a whole, a 
whole gluttony of knowledge that developers need to know to use these APIs well. And unfortunately, uh, the internet and Stack Overflow are littered with insecure example answers. So if I, as a developer, um, don't know a lot about cryptography and I just need to encrypt some data, the first thing I'm going to do is to Google it and maybe copy and paste some code from Stack Overflow. And with these APIs, since they're so difficult to use securely, that code that I'm going to have copied um, is very likely going to introduce vulnerabilities into my application. And here at Data Theorem, we actually observe uh, real world apps getting these wrong all the time. And we frequently have to inform customers about these issues in their cryptography code. So here's an example that I found on Stack Overflow. This is someone asking how to use these common crypto functions to encrypt uh, some piece of data. Um, and there's this, this sample answer with, you know, a thousand plus upvotes. And there are so many problems just in this little snippet of code, just listing them off. Um, this example statically embeds an encryption key, meaning that if I have access to the app package, I can, it's trivial for me to pull out this key and then be able to decrypt any data that you've encrypted. So this, this totally breaks your encryption. Um, additionally, this code snippet uses the RC4 encryption algorithm, which is long known to be unsafe and should not be used uses an insecure ECB mode, which is also unsafe. Um, and it uses a null initialization vector, which um, isn't quite as bad as statically embedding an encryption key, but um, an attacker could, for example, see when the same data is encrypted multiple times um, if you don't use a strong initialization vector. So all of these things work in tandem to leak information, to break encryption, um, and it's all due to um, a really difficult way to use these APIs in, in a secure way. So the question is, is there a better way to do this? Can we design some API that um, allows us to securely encrypt data by default? And of course the answer is yes. Uh, with iOS 13, Apple has introduced this new framework called CryptoKit, which makes it really easy and straightforward to encrypt data securely. So in comparison to the old CryptoKit APIs, um, excuse me, in comparison to the old common crypto APIs, CryptoKit makes it nice and easy um, and straightforward to encrypt data. So you can see in this code snippet, um, essentially what's happening here, the details don't matter so much, but the idea is um, I'm asking for a private encryption key, um, and then I just ask it to sign some data with it, just two steps, get an encryption key and use it to encrypt data. There's no setup or you know configuration to do. Um, it just makes sense. Additionally, the new CryptoKit API leverages a chip on the device called the Secure Enclave, which manages the private encryption keys for you. So the developer no longer needs to know anything about what encryption keys they're using or how to store them securely. It's all managed by the system. So the the primary benefit of this new API is that it's safe by default. Instead of developers needing to know and understand these complex cryptography algorithms, they can just use this, you know, sort of obvious out of the box API um, and everything will work. So just as a point of comparison, um, on the left, here's some code that I took from a blog post called properly encrypting with AES with common crypto versus the code on the right, which is essentially the equivalent operation with CryptoKit. So these two pieces of code do the same thing. They securely encrypt a piece of data, um, but there's just so much less room to mess up essentially with the CryptoKit example. Um, and it's a lot easier to see what's going on. There's less room for error. So these, uh, these new APIs are, are really awesome. Additionally, as I mentioned, this new CryptoKit API um, the encryption keys are created and managed by this special chip on the device called the Secure Enclave. So this Secure Enclave, um, it's a dedicated um, hardware cryptography chip, which has never been compromised. Um, historically, it's been for Apple only use. And this is what Apple internally uses to secure base ID, um, the iOS file system, any user data that's on the device, all of their messages and photos are encrypted using this mechanism. So with iOS 13 and the new CryptoKit APIs, um, when you use this API, you're essentially getting the same level of security 
that Apple is using internally for all of the user data throughout iOS, including things like the keychain with extremely sensitive data and passwords. Um, additionally, something we see often is developers, for example, hard coding their encryption passwords. And with CryptoKit and Secure Enclave, um, this burden has been removed. Developers don't need to interact with crypto cryptographic keys whatsoever. They just ask the Secure Enclave, hey, create an encryption key, sign this data with it, and the developer never sees or interacts with the cryptographic key directly at all. In fact, it's actually impossible to extract or export these uh, encryption keys from the Secure Enclave. So it's guaranteed that um, there's essentially no way to leak these keys. Um, so similarly to statically embedding some passwords in source code, these older common crypto APIs may tempt developers to statically embed uh, their encryption parameters. Um, and unfortunately, these would be constant for every user on every device configuration. But by using these new APIs and the secure enclave, uh, Apple is guaranteeing a unique per device password, per device password, which is not, which is not only um, inaccessible to the application or the developer, but it also never leaves the device. So another change that Apple made this year is they have um, officially discouraged the use of some hashing algorithms, which um, have been proven to be insecure. But before I jump into that, I thought it might be helpful to just give a quick overview of what a hashing algorithm is. So to put it simply, the purpose of a hashing algorithm is to take some input data, such as a password, and to map it to some output data, which um, looks unique and doesn't really tell me anything about what the input data was. So one really common use of something like a hash algorithm is say that I had some sort of web service where I want the user to type in a password. Now, because I don't want to be storing user passwords directly, um, I can use what's called a hashing algorithm. So the user types in a password, I put it through my hashing algorithm, and I get some output string. And this is what I store. So what happens is when someone goes to log in and they type in a password, I don't check if what they typed in matches some password that I have on file. Instead, I hash whatever they typed in and I check if it matches the hash of the password I have on file. This way, if my service is ever compromised, for example, you can't retrieve users' passwords, you can only retrieve the hashes of them. And hashing algorithms typically have this really nice property where if I change the input even very slightly, like for example, my password one, two, three, to my password four, five, six, um, the hash changes drastically. So it's difficult for someone given only the hashes to figure out what this input data was. So now, what are the problems that a hashing algorithm can have? Well, if a hashing algorithm is vulnerable to what's called a collision attack, then it means that someone has found two inputs which lead to the same hashed output. So you can imagine if I have some user with a password, my password one, two, three, and it results in this hash, but I'm using an insecure hashing algorithm, then an attacker, an attacker could find an incorrect password, which results in the same hash. And the result of this is they would be able to log into this service and authenticate as this user, even without knowing the user's password. So it's really critical for security that you use a hashing algorithm, which um, is not known to be vulnerable to these collision attacks, or it's difficult to exploit these hashing algorithms. So some really common hashing algorithms are MD5 and SHA-1. And unfortunately, these are now well known to be vulnerable to these sorts of attacks. So MD5 has been long known to be insecure for years. Uh, and much more recently, in 2017, Google proved that SHA-1 is vulnerable as well. So both of these um, types of hashing are, vul are vulner vulnerable to an attack uh, where you could craft an input message, which is not the same as the original data, but results in the same hash. So I have a similar graphic over here. I have a, I have a safe document, which goes through SHA-1, uh, and it results in this hash. And then I have an attacker's document, which goes through the same SHA-1 algorithm. And instead of resulting in a, in a different unique hash, because it's not the same input, I get the same hash back out, which could allow an attacker to do any sort of thing. So this year with iOS 13, Apple has now declared that MD5 and SHA-1 are unsuitable for any secure application. Um, there were two common crypto functions, 
which allow developers to utilize these hashing algorithms. They're called CCMD5 and CCSHA1. And they've now been deprecated in the iOS 13 SDK. Additionally, with iOS 13, uh, Apple is now requiring stronger Cypher suites and TLS connections. So what this means is if you make a network request in your app, there's now um, a minimum set of requirements for the cryptography used by the connection. So in particular, Apple is now requiring with iOS 13 that if the TLS Cypher suite is using an RSA Cypher, it must offer at least 2048 bits of security. And additionally, um, the hashing algorithm must be SHA-2 or stronger. SHA-1 is now disallowed. So what's going to happen is that with iOS 13, if you try to connect to a network within the application, which doesn't meet these new requirements, the system will drop the request without, without connecting to the server. So be sure to upgrade your servers to meet these new minimum requirements so that client apps can continue connecting to them. Additionally, Apple previously offered um, a framework called security, which allowed developers to, manip to manipulate lots of low level functionality and configurations with TLS connections. Uh, Apple is now saying with iOS 13 that you should no longer be using these APIs. Instead, they've introduced a new framework called the network framework, which is sort of a, uh, a modern re-implementation um, on this API. So if you do need fine-grained control over TLS connections, you should be migrating to this new network framework. Some other miscellaneous API changes that are coming with iOS 13. Um, Apple has now added the ability to synchronize a core data database with storage that's backed in iCloud. So you could imagine this as a sort of, um, sort of like a RAID scheme. So what happens is, imagine you have an app which or some record of the user's documents in a core data database. Um, with this new API, you can now have essentially a backup of that data on Apple servers. So you can synchronize these two databases. So even if the user's copy is corrupted, you've still stored that data offsite. Additionally, Apple has added this new framework called background task, which can be used to schedule these, um, you know, long running or low priority tasks to be ran when the user is not actively using their device. So an example of this might be um, if you need to train a machine learning model or if you need to index some database, you can now schedule these to happen, for example, when the phone is in the user's pocket rather than when they're trying to do intense work uh, on their device. Lastly, Apple has now added the ability to read and write uh, real world NFC tags utilizing the, uh, the iOS device's NFC chip there's a new framework for that as well. Okay, so let's move into the, the user visible changes landing with iOS 13. So firstly, Apple is providing their own new privacy conscious secure sign-on service. So this is a competitor to, uh, for example, Google and Facebook's SSO. And Google and Facebook's single sign-on services are notorious for utilizing the scheme to collect more user data and track um, the sites that you visit across the internet. Apple's SSO service is sort of a rebuttal to this. They've said that um, privacy is the main focus. Um, and in fact, if a user uses sign in with Apple to sign into your application, the user has uh, really fine grained control over what data the application is allowed to access. Specifically, an app only receives the user's name, um, an email address, and some unique identifier that the app can correlate to track um, users internally. One really nice feature that this has is that Apple has first party support for proxying the email address. So if I, as a user, don't trust some service and don't wanna reveal my primary email address to them, Apple's SSO service um, makes it really easy for me to provide sort of a fake email that will forward everything to my real inbox. So they're doing really nice things with, with user privacy. Additionally, sign in with Apple integrates very nicely into the system. In particular, there's built in biometric two factor authentication via touch ID or face ID. Um, and it integrates with iCloud keychain and syncs across the user's devices. Lastly, if the user so chooses, they can also change the name 
that the app receives. So if I don't want to reveal my identity whatsoever to an app, uh, I can make that choice. Apple is saying that if the app offers any other single sign-on services like Google or Facebook SSO, then it will be required um, for the app to support sign-in with Apple. It's unclear how strictly this will be enforced. Um, so we're going to have to watch what Apple does over the next few months. Additionally, Apple's design guidelines state that the sign in with Apple button must be placed at the top of the single sign on button list. Uh, but again, we're going to have to see how strongly they enforce this rule. Okay, so moving on, iOS 13 has also added new controls and visibility uh, into what apps are doing with their data. One common behavior of apps is to request a location or a Bluetooth permission for some, you know, legitimate reason. Um, and then they constantly access this data in the background to build up a profile of users of where they go, of what they're doing. Uh, and most of the time, the user is not aware of this whatsoever. It's done by the app surreptitio surreptitiously in the background uh, without user consent. So iOS 13 is really cracking down on this and it's sort of alerting users to when apps are doing this. So there are three APIs that are, now have stronger um, privacy restrictions and controls with iOS 13. They are the location services APIs, the Wi-Fi APIs, and the Bluetooth APIs. What exactly happens is if an app requests location and iOS notices that it's been accessing the user's location frequently in the background, it'll periodically um, alert the user, show them what the app has been collecting, and prompt them if they want to continue allowing it. So it's a really nice improvement for, for user privacy. Additionally, um, Apple now has stronger requirements on the Bluetooth APIs. Specifically, if the app accesses Bluetooth at all, um, they must now specify so in the app's uh, manifest file. Um, so there's this NS Bluetooth always usage description that if the app is accessing Bluetooth, you must declare it in the app manifest uh, and give a justification for why that is. We've already seen so far, apps are now being rejected by Apple for not declaring this usage of, of the Bluetooth APIs. So it's critical for any application that's accessing Bluetooth for any reason um, to start declaring this and uh, explaining their justification to users. Lastly, these APIs that allow the developer to um, pull info about the user's current cellular carrier now have additional restrictions. So what happens is um, if the app doesn't have certain permissions, specifically either the location permission or um, other special permissions that are used for this API, um, these APIs to ask about the user's cellular carrier don't return any meaningful data. So you're, not, you're no longer allowed to pull data about the user's network carrier unless these certain requirements are met that sort of equate to the user opting in. Lastly, Apple has introduced new restrictions on third-party tracking within kids apps. So what Apple is saying is that with iOS 13, if your app is marketed towards kids, it's no longer allowed to contain uh, any third-party ads or analytics SDKs. Uh, this is cracking down on, you know, trying to track kids um, maybe push in-app purchases on them, et cetera. So it's a, it's a nice move on Apple's part. Of course, some apps, some free apps in particular do rely on ads uh, as their business model to sustain the app. Um, and there's been some pushback on Apple for this. So what they've said over the past few days is that they are going to delay this decision and rework the guidelines for what this means exactly. So we'll be watching this space um, to see what Apple says the, the real new requirements are. So in summary, with iOS 13, Apple has introduced um, new encryption APIs, which make code more secure by default and make it easier to securely encrypt data. Apple has um, explicitly discouraged these vulnerable hashing algorithms. They've introduced stricter requirements for network connections. They've added new capabilities for developers to refactor their applications, make them more resilient to data loss, to improve their apps. Um, they've added a new single sign-on service um, which protects user privacy, um, and they've provided more visibility and rules around um, tracking users. That's all I had. Thank you.
so with that, we'll give everyone a moment to go ahead and put their questions in the Q&A panel. Um, and then we'll go ahead and start taking some of these. So uh, Philip, the first one is, are the old crypto APIs still available? Yeah, it's a good question. So I understand, you know, these APIs, these old common crypto APIs are used widely throughout real world code. And it's a, a difficult sell to drop everything overnight and migrate to these new APIs. So these old crypto APIs are still ab available. They're not actually deprecated by Apple yet. Um, but in the developer documentation, Apple is strongly encouraging developers to move to these new secure APIs as soon as possible. Great. Uh, next one. Can I opt out of these new TLS requirements? Yes. So Apple does provide a mechanism to, if for whatever reason your server um, can't support a secure connection, can't support HTTPS uh, or what have you, they provide this mechanism called um, app transport security exceptions, which allow you to define rules for uh, which domains you want to essentially whitelist. Um, that said, it's sort of viewed as a as a bit of a hack. Um, generally, you want all the networks that your app connects to to be um, secure and to use secure network connections. So the ideal case um, is to update the servers to support these new requirements. Um, but in the meantime, you are able to declare to iOS, hey, I know this server to be insecure for whatever reason, allow my app to connect to it anyways, because I control it. All right, we'll take one more before we finish. Uh, are all of these updates in effect now or are some coming in the future? Right. So everything that I spoke about landed with iOS 13 um, this week. The only thing that's still uh, sort of pending is this um, this new requirement that um, analytics and ads SDKs are not allowed to be embedded within kids apps. Um, this one is still sort of in limbo. It seems like Apple is kind of walking back this new rule. Um, everything else that I discussed, the new crypto APIs, the new deprecations, um, the new uh, visibility into location tracking and other APIs, all of that is live as of this week. All right. Well, thank you, Philip, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. All of the mobile app security that was covered today can be secured using Data Theorem products. So if you have any remaining questions on the presentation or further questions about your mobile app program, please email us at info at datatheorem.com. Thank you very much. Have a great day.